trees and so on and so on, so step by step. And, and yeah, or, or if we want to be calm, so we exercise breathing exercise. So we have little groups, breathing groups, and mm -hmm. so and so on. Pockets of light. Pockets of light. I have a friend that's making it. He's, he has a movement of, of having it so that cities begin to plant gardens on their, on their flat roofs. Yeah. yeah. His name is David Crow. Yeah. Yeah. It actually stops roofs from leaking. Yeah. Seriously, it's a very good way of having a flat roof. Yeah. 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 It's it happening. Is happening. We can't burn wood in Kingston because we're smoking the stones. Yes, that's right. We'll be breaking the law, but hey. But hey, if it all goes, <laughs> if it all goes down, there's no electricity. We'll be warm. I think, <laughs> I think it's probably easy for us not to feel in despair because we live in a safe place, basically. Mm. Mm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. There are still pockets of light in Kosovo and in horrible places where there's war. There are. I've met people all over the world that are doing exactly that. Groups that meet in houses, people that are doing channeling or meditations or cleansings or doing rituals all over the world. Every country, as dark as it gets. And there are some people in the worst countries. I interviewed a man on the radio from Nepal, second poorest country in the world, looking after 95 orphans. He said, God, we've got lots of things. So we feel we're really rich. We look at your country, and we think you're in despair. Mm -hmm. He says, you've got confusion all over you. You've got all the complications of people running out on the roads, getting drunk all the time. doesn't happen in, in Himalayas in the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's just perception. Yes, it's also what happened in Russia, in Soviet country, we can see that one of the things is horrible in, because on the... Uh, King or Tsar to a freedom, and as a, nobody knows what is freedom, so um, you can see as a chaos. But at that time, when the, all the money was taken away, it was a perfect time. It mm -hmm. was a golden age time where there are so many artists, so many creative mm -hmm. people, but this money it was not important. Exactly. There were so many other values and so many other mm. uh, well, qualities were so valuable. You case it haven't you? I mean you're yeah. talking we were well, talking about despair is connected to the economy and money. Yeah. And actually it's just a delusion that uh, it is yeah. and at this at the same time what we have to recognize is that the way in which we've gotten to all these things popping up is that disaster has always been the best teacher on this planet. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Yeah. Direct disaster. experience always produces a point of choice. That's right. A point of focus with which you have that choice to say what can I do? Where do I go now? Yeah. Where, I, I'm awake because something's hurting me directly. It's not something that I've been told about. It's something I'm experiencing. And at that point, there is that choice. And all over the world, there are different individuals in different cultures able to make choices, aware of their different cultural needs and uh, observations yes. and experiences. And so it's, it's, it's all happening. Perfectly, and yeah. the choices uh, are being able to be made exactly at the moment when they're needed. In that way, what I'd like to add is, and this has to do with um, <coughs> my experience around death and dying and working with people in those circumstances, because I think this is an important aspect of that, and that is that what we need to be aware of, it's like when you are attending to someone who has got a terminal illness and they're dying. At some point in the process of tending to someone, most people who are doing that first start willingly. Okay, They care for this person. They're going to help them out no matter what. And then what happens is they happen to start getting up in the night more. And suddenly they start losing their sleep. And suddenly what happens is the demands become stronger. And suddenly you are living on your adrenaline. And at some point you run out of your adrenaline. And you're just raw, direct, and beyond what you normally think of in terms of your exertion. 
my look at this, and this is what happens. People go way beyond what they thought was possible of themselves. Okay? In the mindfulness of what we are doing, in the spiritual practices or the commitments that we have, we have to, and this is, gets back to this resilience, can we, at what point do we reach a point past our comfort level? And again, I agree with you that, you know, right now we're talking about these things in very privileged circumstances, you know. Can we keep on going? And the idea is, are we seeing things turn around? And if they don't turn around, are we going to give up? To me, you have to develop a mind that just refuses to give up. No matter what it looks like, that becomes the challenge. And so much of when people do that, it's relatively, um, I'd say, um, uh, within their normal limits. And how do you train people to become so spiritually resilient, you know, to, 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 to go beyond their conventional limits? So, so sorry, you're saying you train people in difficult situations to be resilient and stay centered and connected. Yes. So what is that training? How to, whatever spiritual, I mean, it can be any number of spiritual disciplines. A lot of, a lot of, you know, there are any number of spiritual traditions in the world that train people to develop that kind of resilience. Yeah, but when you have masses, you know, when you're training a small number of people, that's fine, but when you have masses... I think what you do is you exemplify it. You have groups that exemplify it. That's what happens. You, you, you end up seeing groups in the communities that demonstrate that it's possible to survive. And then people begin to ask questions. It's an interesting question about, coming back to what you said about um, uh, Buddhism not being about navel-gazing, is how you strike um, the balance between working on yourself and generating that um, resilience or those qualities of mind and being out there and acting in the world for the benefit of sentient beings. Exactly. Um, what does the Dharma have to say about that? That's just, well, essentially, you've just described it. The idea is you have, to, you have to, in some ways, be able to connect to that experience of that stillness, which allows you then to have a mind that's less, less covered in preconceptions to be able to step out and try and do something. Okay? It's very interesting in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of monastic training. What they would oftentimes find is if people were beginning to space out into and get too preoccupied with being on the cushion, they would throw them out and make them pick carrots, <laughs> you know, do something ordinary for a while in order to re-ground, re-educate them back out into the world. And everybody has their limits. I mean, I think there are some people that have such strong attachments that it's much better for them to go into retreat for long periods of time and just make prayers. And there's other people that find that a little bit of time just peps them up and makes them capable of going back out into the world and working. Everybody's got their different path in that. But essentially, it is a question of always taking that practice and learning how to reintegrate it. Isn't, to, to use your example, and you were talking about somebody who is um, dying and, and so having to be looked after, and you have to mm -hmm. develop uh, to be able to cope with that. And then this gentleman asked about what you do. It's, it's the action. The way you described earlier about the over medicalization and the medication of the, the sick, the dying, and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, this is wrong, and it has to change. Sure. So the action will come in the process of changing that, in the, in the time until it is changed, the process, you, you have to be strong. But the, the actual, it, you don't have to go beyond and beyond all the time because it will change. And it's actually changing now as mm -hmm. we speak. And it as will. we speak. Yeah. 13-year-old mm -hmm. girl refusing medication. Yes, exactly. Well, Wonderful time. example. Yes, dignity. Yes. Yes. In, um, she, maybe she knows she came here for a... Yeah, yeah, and the media likes this story and they picked it up and it's going to mean a lot to a lot of people. Yes. It's the best reinforcement of the hospice movement that's ever probably happened in this country. Mm -hmm.